had this kind of rock, and there are other places where this rock exists, but this is kind of a, I don't know whether it's pozzolanic or what the deal is with it, but they grind it, they grind up limestone, this cement rock and clay, and they, and they put it in this, that big tumbler that you saw in the film, that's an oven that fires it, and, and this is where all the energy goes in making it, which is a little bit of the, now the, the, um, mm, less green, perhaps, aspect of, of cement, uh, that it takes, a, it takes a, a lot of energy to, to fire it. They put in iron ore uh, just to, as a flux, so the temperature doesn't have to be quite so high, because it, it, you know how a flux works, it allows the chemical, what does it do, allows it to break down or melt easier uh, in the presence of the iron ore. And that's what gives it the gray color is actually from the iron ore because, well, limestone's a little bit gray, but it's pretty chalky white. And I think the cement rock is a lighter color. And clay is, I guess they can pick what clay. I don't know what the clay deal is. Pretty white, too. But the, the real gray color comes, I think, from the iron ore flux. This is why white medusa, if you're familiar with that, what they do is they, they just leave out the iron ore. And uh, that doesn't affect the strength at all. It just means it has to be fired at a higher temperature. Uh, so it's more expensive to manufacture it, but then you get this pretty white color. So if it's worth it, you can, you can do that. Uh, then after this is uh, fired, it comes out in, in like clinkers, I think. It's like, uh, you know, vitrified uh, sand or something. You know, it's in, in little crumbly clinkers. I don't know how big they are exactly, but uh, something like that. And, and then that gets ground up and pulverized into the, into the powder. And I think then after they grind it, they mix in a little gypsum, is what I read. And that's what, that's what they put in the sack. And, and of course, then it's also got additives for the, the different types, the, the type one, two, three, four, five, like that. But basically, that's, that's the process. So that's sort of to, um, <laughs> was just to answer that question. Now, actually, I'd like to um, kind of finish this up. We spent a lot of time on, on the uh, 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 material concrete. We went through this thing, and uh, I think we're up to here. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm like half a lecture behind, so I'm going to try to, try to get through concrete uh, rather quickly today. I think you've actually already done the problem on concrete, didn't you? Yeah, so this is maybe <laughs> less interesting. Um, but that, because I want to get through the steel, because this week we're supposed to be doing the steel. Anyway, but to, to say a little bit more about the concrete and get into the design of it, um, there's a, in terms of design, there's a, a, a handy parameter uh, that, def that combines a couple of variables. The, the, the challenge with concrete is, in designing that there are so many variables. There's the, the dimensions of the size, uh, and then also the amount of steel in it. So it's like an added dimension in there plus the steel. Then there's also the, the, the quality of the concrete. There's also, uh, of course, a variable of, of, of uh, how much load is on. But then there's also the proportioning of these things, because you want a particular mode of failure. You want it to, um, to fail ductily, not, not brittily. So, um, having so many variables makes it a little bit more complex to design than, say, steel, which is a very homogeneous material, and, and the sections are defined. There's not so much variability. Um, uh, to try to get a handle on that, one, one uh, parameter that's, that's commonly used is rho. And rho is simply a, combines the dimensions, the, the effective uh, section, this is uh, the width and the depth down to the centroid of the steel and the, and the uh, amount of steel. This is then a, a, like a percentage of steel that's in the beam, how much steel is compared to how much concrete. And this, this um, ratio uh, says a lot about the behavior of the steel. If you think about it, if you have, uh, if you look at the different scales, from a very small amount of, if rho was very small, this would be a very small amount of steel. 
say, say we hold the, uh, the cross-section constant, okay? And, and to go through, to compare, oh dear, that's not good. <laughs> what we want to do here is not restart now. All right. Um, let's see. Right. If, if we consider, to, to go through this comparison of the different levels of, of steel, different percentages of steel, let's assume that we're holding the, the, con the, the cross section of the beam constant, and we'll just vary the amount of steel. So you kind of see the, the range. Okay? So starting at, at the, the bottom, so to speak, very little steel. Uh, if you had a beam with absolutely no steel, that would be a row of zero. Zero steel and whatever cross section. In, in that case, when, when failure occurs, if I start loading it, at some point a crack will develop, right? Well, with no steel in there at all, as soon as a crack starts to develop, it propagates very quickly and there's nothing to stop it. It'll just, it's like a sheet of glass or something. It's a, a rock, a brittle material. When the crack stops, um, it'll just continue. It, it continues to propagate because as it, as it travels, the area gets less and less. Well, the, the load was such that with the full area, it caused it to crack. If I have less area, it's going to crack more. So once a crack starts, it's catastrophic. It cracks all the way through. That means that if you, you reach a certain load with it, it starts to crack, it's just boom. It cracks all the way through. It's like a, a, any brittle material. It fails instantly. Uh, so if you're on top of it, that's not a very good, if you're on, underneath it, it's worse. It's not a very, not a very good uh, mode of failure. It's not what you want in, in a usable, in a building. Uh, it's not safe. Uh, you could put a little bit of steel in it, uh, just enough so that when, it, when that first crack occurred, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't continue to, to fail. There'd be enough steel in there to catch it, and the, the steel would then take over in the bottom and, and prevent it from cracking anymore. Okay, this would, it, uh, if you had just a very, very little bit of steel um, that wasn't enough to prevent the crack from propagating, say you just had a fine thread of steel, well, it'd be next to nothing, it would still crack. But you have to have, if there was some minimum amount of steel that did prevent the crack, that would be what we that what what we kind of define conceptually as as a minimum amount, and that would then prevent it from from a catastrophic failure. Now, as I add more steel to it, the row I'm I'm increasing this number here, so the row gets higher and higher. Eventually, I could reach a point. Um, well, let's say before I reach that point, if even at this point, um, if I, when I load it, the the steel initially prevents the uh, crack from propagating. As I as I continue to load it, the steel carries more load. It stretches more. The steel eventually yields uh, before the the. And, and then allowing the concrete to, to crack more and, and leading to ultimate failure. So the, the failure with, from, you know, if I just had a thread, of a thread of steel in there, obviously the steel would just snap, right? If I had more steel, the steel yields. I can have more and more steel. As I put more steel in there, uh, the steel becomes stronger. At some point, uh, I build up enough strength that the, the, the concrete and the steel both reach their allowable limit at the same time. This would be uh, what you call balance. That the steel is, is just starting to yield when the concrete is, is at its full capacity, allowable capacity. Okay, so both, both materials reach their full potential. The, below that, the steel is yielding before the concrete reaches its its full capacity, and by yielding, opens up the crack wider, and then subsequently, the the concrete fails. Uh, it probably, I mean, you could. Well, if you define failure as the yield point of the steel, then as soon as that steel yields, then you you'd consider it failed. But although it's failed, the beam hasn't collapsed. So you have to see a difference there between 
the, when the concrete fails, the beam really collapses. There's not going to be anything to hold it up once the concrete fails. If the concrete crushes in the upper, in the upper flange, in the top side of the beam, when that happens, it, it, it crushes. I mean, it's, it's catastrophic. You, you know, it's not just a crack, it crushes. And, and that, uh, that would, the whole beam would then collapse. The steel yielding is also called failure, but it's, it's not catastrophic in the sense that the thing doesn't fall on the ground. It just, it opens up a wider crack. So really, that's the failure you want. You want the, that crack to, to open up because as that, as that crack opens up, the beam, the beam sags more and more. Little dust particles fall on your head. <laughs> you see this ceiling sagging. Uh, you have this sense that something's not right, and you get out. <laughs> you leave. You know, you stand at the door and maybe look in. Maybe you don't. Maybe you go clear out of the building because you figure this is a bad building. <laughs> Beams falling down. At any rate, it's, it's a much safer situation for the occupants. The less likely that the whole thing's going to fall on their heads. So, so up to this point, from, well, this is not so good, but from here where the steel starts to yield to here where they're balanced, this is the safe range. Now, if you go above balance, uh, this means that you have, if you have so much, I keep putting more steel in the bottom. I have so much steel in the bottom now that it doesn't yield. It, it's uh, enough that it just, it holds it together. Well, it, it holds it together in the bottom half of the beam, but it, the top side still fails in compression then. It'll be the next thing that fails. So that would be beyond balance. Balance is where, where they both fail together. Under balance would be the steel yields first. Above balance, the concrete yields first. Concrete crushes. Uh, it, it uh, exceeds its allowable limit. So in that case, that's also catastrophic. Instead of, I mean, when I was down here, the steel was failing in tension, or the, the concrete was failing in tension and failed. Up here, the concrete fails in compression on the other side of the beam. And it's still catastrophic. When the concrete fails, it's always pretty catastrophic. It's just, it's exciting, but you really don't want to be under it or in it or on top of it. So. So uh, let's see. Yeah, the balance is the maximum. What, oh, this was less than balance. I kind of got off of my thing. Here's balance. This is, this is less, uh, the row less than balance. And this is then row greater than balance, what I just described. That's the, that's the brittle failure of the concrete. So in designing a beam, a good, a good approach is to target the row. Because by targeting a row, you're able to target a behavior. You still want it to carry a capacity, but what you want is a, a beam that carries the capacity you want and still has a row that's probably uh, above minimum, certainly, below, below this balance, somewhere in here, <laughs> somewhere in that range. And, and there are numbers that get you there. This is minimum. This is, this is the, what is uh, used, and it works out to be just mainly through experience or testing. This is the... the uh, where the, the steel is first effective in preventing the uh, brittle failure. So that tells you where the minimum is. And you can see that. You could immediately calculate that. You just need the yield stress of the, the uh, uh, steel. And it gives you this row. Then you plug this row back in here. If you know your dimensions of the beam, then you immediately know how much steel that takes to be there. So that tells you quite a bit. And this, this one, this, is, this has been. Well, is, I think it's an empirical kind of formula that is just an amount that seems to work well. Uh, it, it, this generally puts you right in the middle of this range. It's a, a conservative number that uh, is safe to use. So this, this number here, all you need is the, the, uh, the failure strength of the, the concrete, right, which you, you're specifying, the, the yield strength of the steel, which you would uh, likely know, like what grade steel you're using, 60. So that immediately gives you a row. And again, you can then use that row and the dimensions of the beam to calculate how much steel you need. So very immediately, you can get a sense of, of how much uh, steel is required. Then to get the, the balance amount takes a little bit of uh, calculation. So from, from the, um, 
example we did before, let me see. Uh. This is the one we did last week, right? We could calculate, we could calculate a row. Huh? Here, turn the light on a second. Not that light. <laughs> well, that's all right. No, leave that light on. That's OK. That's all right. Uh, that's good enough to see up there. The AS was three number nine bars, which are an inch each. So that's three. The B was 12 inches. The D, are you ready? <laughs> that's not what I'm asking. <laughs> 17. <laughs> I may have this written down. Occasionally, I write numbers down on my. What'd you get? Seven. Not a very big number, but it's it's just an, a ratio. So that would be like uh, one point four, one point five percent is is kind of the number it is in a sense. Um, anyway, hmm. Oh, let's see. What would row min be? That would be, what was it, 200 over Fy. Oh, oh shoot. Now i got to remember what the dimensions of Fy are. Mm. I think there must be PSI. What, what grade steel is this? Does it say? Should have said somewhere. 60. Looks great. Let's I don't see it up there. Oh, oh. Yeah, it's yeah, it's buried in that 20 KSI. I think that is 60. You think so? Yeah. Okay. Okay, and this is then in PSI. This is one of those equations that you have to be careful with. So what is that? Two divided by Oh, yeah, that sounds right. Three something? Oh, all right. So this is greater than the minimum. Good news, right? The other thing, then the next question would be what's balanced? You know, where is, where is this uh, to get a sense of where we are in the design, right? We know, we know what row we're using, what's, and we know it's above the minimum. What would balance be? Now, yeah, now you can turn these back off. Let's see, to get balanced uh, takes a little bit of, of calculation. It's based on, it's based on the uh, stress diagram. This is a stress. Here's, in fact, here are the same dimensions. Oh, that's handy. Uh, here are the same dimensions that we're using. Uh, this, is, this is the, um, the actual, or, or this is the, the allowable maximum stress for the concrete. This is the allowable. It was actually 20, but it's 20 divided by 9, right, is FSN over N. So this is the uh, allowable maximum for the steel down here divided by N. So you get this diagram. OK. Now, what's unknown here, I'm, I'm, changing, I'm changing the ratio of steel to concrete, right? I've kept the, the concrete being the same, so AS has to change. Does that make sense? I mean, compared to here, here I had AS of three. Uh, I don't know what I had. It would have been interesting to back calculate what I had here. If I took this number and then kept this, I could back calculate how much steel that would be. Now, now I want to find the the balance condition. This this uh, row balance. I'm going to have to change the amount of steel, the 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 because this number is changing. This number is staying the same, so this has to change. Uh, so what I'm actually doing here is I'm well. One of the things I guess I'm doing is solving for that that amount of steel. It's the amount of steel that will give me these uh, stresses, this stress here and this stress here. So what I do is I start. I assume my end condition, these stresses. Then given those. I calculate uh, this distance here. Then once I have this, I can, I can go back and, and figure 
out this, and then I can calculate the, the steel. So to get, if I'm starting here, to get that distance there, I can do it with similar triangles. If I know this and I know that, I know there's a big triangle here. I do know this distance D, 17. So this big triangle is similar to, um, let's see, well, all three of them, to this little triangle and this little triangle, all three of these. So there's the big triangle. That's because, see, that's this plus that distance. That's this base and this height. There's the 17. This is the 2.2 and 1.8. OK, that's that. Then I've got this similar triangle here. There's, that's that one. OK, that would give me, that has x in it. If I wanted the other one, this is the x down to here, I guess. Uh, that would be this triangle. So I can use those. I mean, here, this one's complete. And I can use this and solve immediately for x, right? Which is probably what I did. Well, actually, I solved for, for there's x. That's that one solved. Uh, oh, here's x. There it is. So that, that distance, 7.6, is that height right there. OK, knowing that and knowing that these, it, it, I can form this diagram then, right? This is the, the stress block here in compression. This is the uh, NAS down here. This is what I had before as the transform section last week, right? So now I've jumped to the transform section because I, I know this x distance. I'm able to, to do that immediately. I know these areas balance. This, this moment, this area times that moment arm is equal to this, this uh, area times this moment arm, right? They, that's, the, that's the definition of the neutral axis, basically. It's where those two sides balance, this, the fulcrum. So I set that up. There's the area times the moment arm, area times the moment arm. And, and I know this area. I know that moment arm. I know this. Uh, yeah, that's why I calculated that up there. That's handy. And I know n. The only thing I don't know in all of this is as. So I can solve all this for as. And that gives me the as. The asn 4, 411. OK, you can turn that back on for a second here. So that would be the, the 411 over uh, 12 times 17 again. That gives me that, that uh, row up there, uh, 0.020. Seven is it? Oh, one seven. Okay, so this is balanced. This one. <laughs> Can make a C. Okay, that one's balanced. So, so you can see the balance case then is a higher percentage of steel than certainly than the minimum. It's even fortunate. So this one. What we designed, or what we analyzed, I guess, didn't we? We analyzed was indeed in between these two. It's greater than the minimum, and it's, it's less than, like it's by a third, huh? less than the, the balance. So that works out well. So you have a sense of where you are in the, in the design. OK, yeah, shut that back off. Now, another way, another method to. Um, design with this, and, and Engel shows this in the, the textbook. It's kind of um, an alternate way to approach it from what, what we did last week. You know, you can think of it as redundant, but it's also easier. <laughs> it's less, um, I guess we, it's nice that we went through the, the uh, method last week because it's very um, theoretically easy to understand. It's based on, on the the transform section and, and MC over I. It's very similar to what, you know, conceptually you know what's going on. This one uh, also works, but, uh, and it's a lot easier, I think you'll see, but it kind of obscures what's going on um, in the way that the equations are set up. Uh, in other words, it's, it's a lot of derived equations that are very quick and easy to use, but it, it kind of um, is not very, Mm, translucent in terms of what's going on. What, what they do in this method, uh, you don't have to build a transform section at all. 
instead the transform section would be in here. Okay, it's gone. Instead, you look immediately at the the uh, stress diagram, and you set up some relationships in the stress diagram. You know that there is a neutral axis somewhere, right? And the neutral axis is uh, uh, defined by this distance. This was what we called x. Here we call it kd because it's a it's a factor of d, right? K is then k times d. You know that gives you that. And there's uh, say no. Is it going to keep doing that every four minutes or what? <laughs> oh gosh. Okay, and the other one's also a. Uh, then you can see where it's going. You don't have to, this is, this is why we needed to build the transform section before. Was the Pyth what was it? Not Pythagorean. The um, mm, quadratic, right? <laughs> quadratic equation to uh, figure that out. Well, this, you, you would have to work a quadratic equation, but they work it, I mean, it's, you can work it out in terms of a formula that's a little bit easier then. Uh, this, this distance between the moment arms is also d times a factor that they call j. Then this is a third of this triangle. If this is kd, then this is a third of that kd. That's that piece up there. This is simply the, the volume of this um, uh, stress block here. This is a triangle times the width b. Right? So here's a triangle uh, depth times, you know, it's this times that divided by two. So that's a triangle. And that's the, the width of it. So that's the volume, the volume of that triangle there. And this is simply uh, AS times the stress, the area times the stress to give that force. So you've got these two forces. Hmm, that one seems to be mislabeled. Should be a T, I believe. I don't know why it's C. Uh, yeah, that one should be T, sorry. Um, and, then you, and then you set up all these formulas. You can derive, you, you, it's done in terms of rho, and this is very convenient too, because like we just saw with rho, uh, you can pick a rho. You can pick a rho much more easily than you could pick, say, an amount of steel. An amount of steel, you're clueless. Who knows how much steel? Because it varies with every, with every beam, and there's, it's hard to have much of a feel for it. But these numbers for rho, I mean, as long as you're using this grade steel, that's constant. And, and this, this middle number, whoops, that we had earlier, where'd it go? This number is also independent of, of my, I mean, this becomes for a grade of steel and a, a grade of concrete and a grade of steel is kind of a constant too. So those are numbers that you have a, uh, or can easily calculate or have a sense of. So you can plug the row in the n is the uh, you know the modular ratio, this thing here, and you can immediately get a k. Well, once you have a k, you've already got. You're assuming you have the d probably. Uh, you can immediately get this. Well, if you've got that, then you can get this. If you've got those, you can get this. So you see, they plug in fairly easily. Once you once you get these two, the rest of it falls out pretty quickly. You can calculate the moment. Uh, this, let's see, mm. oh, here's, here's the formula for C, so I can plug C into there times the, uh, this, which is, and the J comes out fairly easily with the K. So it's just a matter of, of plug and chug. You have all the pieces, you kind of go through and, and you start with this and work down, and then you plug them into here to get what values you want. If you're analyzing it, then you're looking for the moment and you, you use one of these formulas. If you're designing it, you're looking for the steel, probably. Or you could be looking for the dimensions, perhaps. And then you have to assume uh, a steel ratio, at least, or something. Um, and you can plug those in. So to give you maybe a quick example of this, uh, this is an analysis using this method. And this, oh, it's exactly the same one we just did, or did last week. Uh, 12 by 17 with three inches of, of uh, steel. Now, when we did it before, you remember we went through, it took like uh, half an hour to do the transform section and calculate to find uh, KD, to find this, which we called X. 
Um, see if I can find it. That that right there. We went through. That's what you have to solve the quadratic, right? This is where we went through here. You solve the quadratic, and you get six point seven eight. Well, with this other, using these formulas, whoops, yeah, here we go. You calculate your, your uh, row, which is what we did a minute ago. That's that row. You plug the row in there times the, the uh, 9. That, that factor gets is put into this formula. You just chug it out. You get that. You multiply that. That's K. Multiply it by D is 17, and boom. Bob's your uncle. So it's a lot faster than um, um, other methods might be, but it you know I mean it's it's probably it's probably only so useful for you to see that it, 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 when you come across concrete calculations I guess uh, that you'll see a lot of letters like J D and and rho n and that kind of stuff and this is where this is where they're all coming from. This is what that's plugging into, and and you can rather quickly then. Uh, let's see if you. This is assuming the steel controls, which of course is, the steel would yield if it's below if it's below balance. Assuming I guess it is assuming here that it's below balance, because um, we haven't really calculated that yet. Um, then you can then you put in the, um, the stress for the steel there and. You calculate the uh, tension stress in the steel, then you can uh, use that to calculate the moment, and you find that's probably the same number we got from the from the other day. So inside a few calculations, you can do an analysis fairly quickly. See, you know, really any of these parameters here. You know, we here we just did uh, this one. Well, excuse me. We did this one. We we solved the t. We solved this equation here for t. Had j d and calculated a moment. So that's what that's what that is. Uh, there's also a design procedure that you can do with this. It's a little a little more cumbersome, and I don't know that I'll. It's worth it to go through in too much detail, because I don't really expect you to. I mean, on the ex I can tell you this on the exam. This would take. The design procedure is a little bit too long to try to do on an exam problem. It's take, the reason it's longer is because it usually takes iteration. In the textbook, I think he gets to a certain point and, and in a rather classic manner says, and by a few trial and error steps, you get to the next number. And <laughs> yeah, you would have to fish around quite a bit to get, get to where he got with the next step. And it's, it's kind of true with this, too. The reason is you've got, you've got a couple of you got a couple of parameters. You've got your, you can choose a row. You've got uh, D that maybe you're working with. The, the AS, uh, let's see, what is the other one? Yeah, the AS is also an unknown. Oh. Well, no, you don't have to turn them on. I'm not going to write any more than that. But there, there are some parameters that they affect each other. The, the AS and the D are maybe both unknown, and they both impact uh, the row. So that if you, fix, if you, if you choose a row, you, you almost have to assume everything but one variable before you get to where you're going, which is sometimes more assumptions than you want to make. If you don't make all those assumptions, say you want to, you want to find both the depth of the beam and the, the amount of steel in it, well, then you've got, uh, you're going to have to work it several times before you get it to, to uh, balance out. And maybe, it might, I'll go through this quickly because I really don't want to spend too much time on it. Uh, but this is, this is one where part of what made this, this one easier to solve is it's assuming it's exactly at a balanced condition. And at a balanced condition, then you know, uh, you know what the stress diagram is going to be. It's not drawn up here, but maybe it is on the next one. Uh, so this assumes here's the size of the beam. The amount of steel is actually unknown, but I'm going to. Mm, oh, I don't think I even I don't think I even chose D here. So these two are both 
two unknowns, but I do know that it's a balanced condition. So you can solve the modular ratio. You can build this stress diagram, which you can do at balance, uh, which is, I guess, a good reason. In designing beams, the balance condition, by the way, would be the most efficient one, actually, right? May not be the most economic, but it's using the material to the full, and it's going to be the, the shallowest section. You can't go, you're not going to be able to go much shallower than that. Um, and it's also the most, um, it fully utilizes the material. The, the downside of it, it, it probably has more steel in it more steel than a less than row balanced, right? So it may not be the most economic section. At any rate, um, to go on with this one, if you assume this case here, um, that this is, this is the full capacity of the concrete, this is the full capacity of the steel, then you can build these diagrams, then you can look at uh, proportional triangles. This is this triangle here to x as, um, let's see, d, this one here to that. So these two triangles. And then you can solve it for uh, d in terms of x. That's solving, yeah, and d, of course, is that whole length there. Uh, then you can look at this, this equation for the, um, this vector here, the R, rc, the force on, on the concrete. That's the formula that we had a second ago for that. This is the, the volume of this, this stress block. You can, again, plug in all the numbers except for x and solve that RC in terms of x. So now you've got D in terms of x. You've got RC in terms of x. You can write a moment equation that's got RC times uh, this. This is the uh, moment arm. And plug this value in and that value in, both in terms of x and the moment was what you're designing for. So you get an equation like that. That you reduce down, and you can eventually solve it. You don't even have to do a quadratic. It comes out x squared is that, which is 9. So you can that one worked out fairly easily uh, for a balance condition. It gives, you the, it gives you then x, which is this is the stress block 9. And then you can quickly get d, and that solves, that solves the, the depth of it. 24 inches, and then given plugging the x back into here, you can find uh, the force and assume the force in the concrete, and that has to be balanced by the force in the steel, RT and RC being balanced. So that gives you the steel, which comes out, assuming that as the value of the steel, well, that, that was given. That gives you then um, the area of the steel. So you can get. So there it designed the depth and the area of the steel, but it assumed a balanced condition. If you didn't assume that balanced condition, then it would be a little bit more rigmarole to go around, but because you couldn't have used that, uh, that uh, triangle thing initially. Anyway, all right, so I'm going, e gads, what, 10 minutes left here. Actually, I want to give at least a little bit of an intro to the concrete, uh, to the steel, so that your friendly GSIs can can go on with it on. How do I shut this thing off? Oh, there it is. So this is actually the next chapter, and I, it's steel is a lot easier than concrete. It is. Maybe just possible in 10 minutes I could show you how to design a steel beam if we skip the beginning. Um, yeah, we'll talk. I'll tell you what, on Friday I'll come back. Whoop, all right. <laughs> that works. What did I do? Oh, I was, I was hitting the wrong one. Okay. Uh, I'll come back and talk more about different sections. And Matthew is, is actually producing sections that you can visually see, and we'll talk about that. But what we'll talk about now is maybe the, um, the way the stresses uh, affect the strength of, of steel beams. In designing steel beams, 
you do have to take, it, the, the stability becomes very important. Uh, when it fails in stability, it doesn't have near the strength as it would if you could here hold the middle of it there, so it doesn't do that. If you brace it, then it's much stronger. Yeah, not hold it up, but just, I mean, you know, like that. So, so there's a, like the column buckling, uh, when we looked at column buckling, the Euler equation, of course, had a, it, it would buckle at a much lower stress for a, a slender column than it would crush at. The crushing stress is always the ultimate limit of the material, right? And in, in flexure, if I, if I develop a, uh, here you can turn the lights on for a second. Uh, if I develop a, uh, if we assume this is the limit of the material, if I have a, a stress diagram that looks like that, that means I've, I've stressed it all the way uh, to yield point on the extreme fibers, right? This is kind of the limit that we use, I think, with wood beams. When we did wood, this was it. This was the failure criteria for wood, uh, basically. You'd use an allowable value up here, but when you reach the allowable value, that was it. And this is, this is looking um, at kind of the ultimate. I mean, you can also put an allowable value in here, but just looking at the behavior of it, this would be where the, the outer files, fibers yield. That's what's... That's what's taken as a basic uh, case, so to speak, and that's what's defined by this right here. When, when you meet this, when this is able to take place, then you've got um, 0.6 Fy. That's a, equals the allowable. Okay, that's the allowable flexure stress. If you've got something less than that, uh, this would be maybe in terms of lateral torsional buckling. Maybe you don't, you don't reach this. Fy is, or the F, right, whatever it is in Fletcher is, is less than Fy. Okay, this would be decreased stress. And it's decreased because the failure, before, before it reaches this, it fails like this. It's a stability failure. So the equations here, because they involve stability, it's like the Euler failure. It's much more complex. And they're the parts that you see graphed with these curves. They're down here somewhere. Uh, this one is right there. It's that first plateau between the hollow dot. This is, this is a graph of the the uh, allowable stress, the allowable stress versus the, the length of it. So as I increase the length, it becomes more likely to, to fail uh, in, in uh, this decrease case or in the, the, that would be this one down here. It's down here somewhere. There, it's getting longer. As I get shorter with it, shorter could be, I mean, just in terms of bracing. It's braced at a shorter position. It's, it's less likely to, man, I can't even make it do that. When you brace it like this close enough, it's, it's pretty stable. It would then fail uh, more like, it would not fail like this. It would, it would reach its full uh, plastic section. That would be here. Now you see there's also one step above that up here. And here, turn the lights back on a second. This is just, this is just failing the extreme fibers, but of course I could... I could, if I went further, um, I could yield the fibers full, further down, right? I could get a picture like that. Or I could get, uh, if I put more load on it, then maybe uh, more, more fibers would fail, right? And I could go like that. Or I could put a, ultimately, the biggest load I could put on it would be this. All the fibers have failed all the way down. That means for the steel, when the first fibers fail here, they fail in terms of yielding, I mean, they yield. The fibers right underneath them haven't yielded. So the beam's still okay, it's just the top. I mean, you, if you saw it physically, maybe you'd see some, if the thing were painted beautiful white, right? And you could see the stress, the stretching cracks appear, 
you'd see the crack, the paint start to crack, the beam's not cracking, but the paint would start to crack at the top or the bottom, right? But, it's, but not in the middle. And as I, as I raise the, the load, now I'm increasing the load, then more of it, more of it yields. That yield, uh, the paint starts to chip a little further down, a little further down maybe, uh, and until that, that yielding takes place all the way down to the neutral axis. Now when, it, now when you reach here, this means in a, in a stress strain diagram, everything's reached this point, right? This is Fy. Well, without any more stress, it, it's very plastic. It stretches very easily. So once it reaches this point, there's no more reserve. It, it, it just, it doesn't break. It's not brittle like concrete, but it just, it's a hinge. It's what's called a plastic hinge. It just collapses. Uh, anyway, so that, to go from here to here, represents an increase of about, um, well, that, oh, an increase of whatever that is, 6%, or however that goes. Fy, okay. So this is the this is the increased case then, and you can get if you can ensure that the beam is so well braced, and it's not only it's not only this way, but also that these flanges don't start to ripple because you can imagine even if the thing doesn't go like this, if I if I could bend it like this in a real steel beam, you might start to get, get wavy lines. You know, the, the flange itself could start to get wavy. That would be uh, the flange buckling or crippling, and, the, and the, the web could also fall apart. Okay, if that, none of that happens, it reaches all the way here, then you get an increased case. So those are the, that's the range of behavior of it. Now, in terms of uh, designing with it, it's a very simple a very simple approach. Uh, the, the allowable, and in, in Engel, he'll, he'll just give you one of these two. Either this is the, for uh, grade 36 steel, this would be the increased case, this would be the normal case. So you'll see these numbers that he uses in the textbook, 24 or 21.6. If it were grade 50, it would be a little higher, 30 and something, whatever. Um, and then you just plug those into the, these MC over I equations, basically. You can use S for uh, I over C, and that gives you, you know, somehow you manipulate these three. You can solve this for section modulus, right? And, you know, if you're given the, the moment, this would be uh, an analysis, I suppose. No, no, this would be design, right? I'm given the load, and I'm given the stress, and here I'm choosing the section, the section modulus, which allows me to pick a section. I might know, this would be analysis here, I would know the, the uh, moment and the section. I could calculate the stress and I could compare it, this would be the actual stress, I could compare it to the allowable stress, compare this to that. Okay, so either way, design or analysis, you use the same very simple uh, equations. If you're designing it, you use a section modulus table like we did with wood as well. You, you find the moment, the stress, this gives you a section modulus. You come to the section modulus table, you run down here to the first one and you pick it. And it's just a, kind of picking it off the, the chart. Um, these numbers over here tell you something about whether it's, it, uh, whether it's in which of these two. If it's uh, below this number, the greatest steel's below this number, then it potentially could be up here. So most of those, they're all okay for almost all grades of steel. This, if you were using grade 50 steel, then this would, would not be okay for that case, for instance. But that's not that important. Um, hmm, one minute, yes, all right. So to do a quick analysis, here you've got uh, a beam, right? The span, the set, the size is given. This is the allowable stress that's given. The only thing we don't know is that right there, the load. We want to find the load. 
So given that, you can look up in the table what the section modulus is. There's a section modulus. Um, this is the equation for the load using the big W. It's not that. This is little w. That's big W. You plug in for the allowable stress here. You had, this was given as 24. Uh, this is given, or well, we, we found it out of the table. So that times that is going to equal the moment. There's the moment in inches. Um, oops, I'm sorry. There's the moment in inches divided by 12, and that gets it to you in kip feet. Then you plug that into the moment equation. Uh, you can solve for big W then. This was written in terms of, you have to be careful, of big W or little w. It would be little w L squared over 8 or big W L over 8. That'll give you that, that load, total load. You divide that by the length, and you'd get the, the little w, um, 1.2. So that's, it. that's an analysis. The design, we're kind of a little bit over, but it's not much more difficult design you you're not given the section size here you're given the load the span you calculate the moment you have the you have the stress you find a section modulus you take the section modulus you go into the table what was it 64 60 64.7 there we go and you pick a you pick a section so that comes out from the table this is the table in angle in angle Whoa, well, maybe the GSIs will more slowly go through those steel examples Wednesday. But it's much less, much less involved than the concrete, so it shouldn't be too difficult.